Welcome to the digital podcast that explores how different organizations transform the way they create and capture value with digital technology. Marcus, good morning, and thank you for uh, joining the digital podcast. I'm really excited uh, to hear about all the things that you're doing uh, at Fujitsu and, and also um, especially the, uh, uh, the notion of cultural transformation, which I know you're very passionate about. So um, perhaps uh, we can start by uh, you introducing yourself. Uh, maybe you can say a little bit about how you ended up with Fujitsu, um, the various roles that you had in the past and uh, what makes you so passionate about uh, digital transformation. <laughs> sure. Apanas, uh, thank you very much for inviting me. It's lovely, lovely to be here today um, and to have the opportunity to talk to you about something which is, which is so exciting and is very relevant in the mind of many, many organizations that we talk to today. Um, by way of a background, I started off in this industry uh, a long time ago, um, really working in the area initially of uh, data and analytics, data warehousing. It used to be back in the day. Um, various roles, starting off, um, starting off with Hoskins that became Capgemini, uh, then IBM, and I found my way from data warehousing, moving, if you like, forward in the stack in technology to CRM, and working a lot with customers in customer relationship management, and that was a, a number of years spanning um, small organisations, and also spending a number of years at Microsoft. Um, working with them to build their, as their CRM products matured and came to market, working with some of their largest customers in the UK to actually deploy customer relationship management in all of its forms. Um, and that's what really started me to get the feel for, <clears throat> if you like, the human computer interface and the, the role significantly of how technology can both enable change and can drive change, but more importantly, how by not considering the human aspects, um, and that's particularly manifest in the CRM space, that you can you can start to you can start to cause as many problems as you can solve with um, with some of these deployments, um, and also you don't tend to get the full benefits of them. From Microsoft, I spent some time at Capgemini doing a very very similar role, and then I've been I've been at Fujitsu for nine years, working uh, as our chief digital advisor. Um, head of strategy and growth in our digital transformation business, uh, working alongside a number of colleagues who spend their time, if you like, helping customers solve their problems, realize their digital ambitions and increasingly their sustainability ambitions. Part of that is the technology, but part of it is the real, the real transformation that needs to be, take place if you're actually doing digital transformation. And I think it's always worth considering is, you know, Digital transformation comes in several forms. You've got everything from digitizing to digitalizing and digital digital transformation itself. And none of them are wrong. They're just different things and understanding what an organization is trying to do from that base level, how it connects to their strategy, et cetera, is really, really critical in being able to drive those benefits. That's great. Thank you for that introduction. Can you elaborate on what you mean by culture of innovation or culture uh, more broadly um, and how do you achieve digital transformation uh, by taking into account the culture um, of, an, of an organization? Sure. So I think when people talk transformation, when they talk large-scale change in an organization, they're often talking about the hard systems. They're talking about technology. They're talking about processes. Uh, they're talking about organizational change many times in the, um, when it comes to transformation. Um, but I think the thing that is still neglected to a large extent, and we have to remember, if you go back to pre-pandemic, there was a statistic that came out from Michael Gale of Strategic Oxygen where he talked about 83%, sorry, 84% of digital transformations were failing, which means that the 1.3 trillion, which has been spent on digital transformation at the time, something over 900 uh, billion had been wasted. It didn't realize the, ambi the digital ambitions in the first place. And inevitably, all of that comes down to culture. And really, we need to think about three things when it comes to culture. First of all, you've got the behaviors that people exhibit. Um, people often use the expression, it's the way we do things around here, but it's actually a little bit more than that. The behaviors that people exhibit or the way they behave when they think that nobody's watching is kind of one of the sort of tenets of the culture. 
The second thing will be the language that people use. Um, David Marquette, for example, published a very good leadership is language and recognized the importance of language as uh, one of the one of the things that ties culture together within an organization and out of an organization as well. And then the third piece, which is largely connected to the first two, is the informal networks that exist within an organization. And many times as I talk about that you're changing the hard systems, you're changing the hierarchy, you're changing the processes, you're changing the team structures, you're changing the technology, but the informal networks still prevail. And it's important to recognize that the influence of the, the behaviors, the language, and the informal networks on the performance of the organization is absolutely massive. It really does define the way things get done within the organization, regardless of the processes and organizational structure and even the measurement systems, which are obviously a very strong influence on it. So when we talk to organizations, we start to try and understand where their thinking is in respect of the cultural implications of any change that they're trying to make in the organization. Right. So it sounds like, um, you know, technology also uh, almost becomes like a, a secondary um, unless you try to transform and you understand the behavioral, the language, the, the internal processes within an organization, um, it becomes very difficult to implement a new technology, no matter how transformative that technology is. I, I guess that's what you're saying, essentially, it is, right? It is very much so. And I, I kind of use an analogy often when I'm talking to people is that if you can imagine that you're taking it into an agricultural setting, if you take um, if you take a field and you throw some seeds into that field without treating the field first, without removing um, things from that field, without plowing the field, without fertilizing the soil, etc., you're going to get mediocre results from the, the crops you, you put into that field at best. Whereas if you prepare the environment correctly, then any change that you want to deliver into that environment is going to have a greater likelihood of success. So I always see that the culture change is if you like, is pre-setting the environment. In many ways, culture change should be the precursor to any of the major changes because it's much easier to make a change into a fertile environment than it is to make the change and then realize you're not in a fertile environment. That's when you get the resistance. That's when you get the barriers because you haven't, you haven't thought about preconditioning the environment before you initiate the change into that environment. And I think that's a lesson that organizations still haven't largely learned because um, naturally in organizations, we foreground the hard structures, the hard systems that I've always talked about. And then culture and the soft things, if you like, get added onto the back of it. And the reality is you're probably going to get a much greater benefit with much lower levels of effort if you actually do it as a preconditioning rather than a post-conditioning exercise. From your experience uh, working with Fujitsu and your clients, how do you go into an organization and first assess or uh, identify the different cultural traits or the different cultural char characteristics and then say, okay, we need to take those and prepare them or transform them into the new reality that's coming with the hard systems, right? The new structural sure. changes. We need to prepare. So how do you go in to make that assessment um, and to learn what the culture is about before you start to transform? How do you do that process? The the best way that we've found of doing it, and this is also working with partners in, in this space as well, um, I mentioned David Marquette and Intent Based Leadership International working with them. Typically it's an observational exercise. Um, you can use surveys to supplement that, but you really, in, in many ways, you have to do it in the same way that you would do a customer experience consulting engagement. You have to observe people doing their work in the place in which they do their work. You have to observe people in meetings. You have to observe people working together. And then you have to observe their behaviors, their language, etc. Because mm -hmm. it's very, very hard to survey culture. It's very, very hard to design surveys for culture. There are some examples out there. But realistically, um, by observing people doing what they do where they do it, you're going to look at how they behave, how they behave in meetings, the language they use at meetings, the structures they use at meetings. Um, when they're working together in teams, when they're collaborating, etc., And very, very quickly, you can pick up what the norms are within the organization. You can pick out um, 
areas that they're avoiding talking about, areas that they're foregrounding to talk about more than anything else. You can understand um, where the decision-making dynamics lie within the organization, where the power structures sit within meetings, et cetera, and how the flow of information works around those meetings, those working informal groups. And very quickly, you can understand if the organization um, is is it market focused? Is it product focused? Is it um, is it risk averse? Is it innovative? All of those things. Looking at the different dimensions of culture and understanding what what it would need to do in order to achieve the goals it's setting for. And I think in many ways that's the other piece that is often neglected is organisations don't think enough about the sort of culture that they need. There's a lot of if you like, reference to organizations who are seen to be, if you like, cool and funky, the disruptors in the world. So they'll talk about the Googles, they talk about the Netflix rules, they'll talk about you know, the, the one pizza teams, they'll talk about um, the processes they use in Amazon, et cetera, all of these organizations who have been incredibly successful and incredibly disruptive. But to just pick cultural artifacts from those organizations and apply them to organizations is not really the way you need to do it. You need to understand what it is your organization is trying to achieve. Where are you strategically? Where are you in position within the market? How is your approach to the market? And what sort of behaviors do you need to underpin that? There's a very strong alignment between um, your purpose as an organization, your strategy as an organization, your brand or image as an organization, uh, and your culture as an organization and making sure that those things are aligned is really the first step in making sure that you're going to realize your your ambitions as an organization because every organization is in, in different markets with different strategies with different positionings and the culture needs to mirror that the culture needs to support and enhance that as I said at the beginning it's the behaviors the language and the informal networks which are one of the most which is one of the most powerful levers within the organization for how things get done, how work gets done, how outputs get created, how outcomes get delivered. So making sure that they are your culture is aligned to your purpose, it is aligned to your strategy, it is aligned to the image um, that you're portraying to the market is absolutely critical in that. And, and I guess some uh, leaders will be more open to suggestions and to advice on, on how to align you know, that brand image, that value proposition in the market with what is actually happening in the organization in terms of mindsets, in terms of language, in terms of behaviors, as you say. And so I'm, I'm trying to get into how do you deliver some of the insights that you gain from engaging in observations and surveys with organizations in order to then uh, you know start the process of okay we need to do xyz you know these things are not aligned and and we need to change them prior to engaging in more structural uh, transformation and if if you could provide some examples of different leaders in organizations that you worked with as you say you know not everyone can be an amazon um, and uh, so, so, so some organizations, I guess, the leaders themselves would be resistant um, to the change. Very much so. Right? So how do you manage that process? I mean, it's, it's a tough sell, to be honest, because um, most organizations, most, many of the leaders have reached a leadership position, certainly if they've come up through the organization, by their position authority being predicated on the, way, on the fact that they know the way things are done around there. Um, mm -hmm. And therefore... They don't necessarily, it's, it's very hard for them to invest in changing the way things are done around there unless, you know, the, certain people have that natural characteristic. They are brave. They can see the, they can see the benefits in doing so. But um, many of them will say, well, actually, I don't, I don't want this to change too much because this is, this is my power base. So what we would tend to do and uh, what we're doing with, a, with an organization at the moment is we're demonstrating how the culture the culture that we've identified, the, be the behaviors particularly that we've identified are causing problems within the organization. What, what problems are manifest from those, those things? So for example, if we used innovation example, we, um, a couple of years ago, we were looking at an organization who had this ambition, like many do, to say, we want to be more innovative. Now, what more innovative means is a, is a whole other conversation that 
you and I have talked about before that we could probably talk about for a very, very long time. But the reality is they want to be, they want to use ideas, they bring those ideas through and be able to take them to market or bring those ideas through and be able to change the efficiencies of the organization, the way that they do things. The problem was that when we um, did the analysis on the organization with our partners, we understood that they were risk averse. The reason they were most risk averse is because they were, um, the informal network was king and your reputation was king within the organization. So therefore, if you did something and it didn't work, the big issue was it damaged your reputation. So you would get squeezed out of the informal network. So we could demonstrate that um, there was a d direct correlation between people being risk averse and therefore them not not doing the innovation piece. What the organization hadn't put in place sufficiently was the ability to recognize and reward people trying things, people learning. So they didn't have a learning organization. They had a everything must succeed organization. If you have an everything must succeed organization, by definition, you cannot be an innovative organization because you cannot try anything that won't succeed. You cannot do anything that will drive learning. So this was something that we were able to shine a light on and then start to think about how you would actually go about changing those behaviors such that uh, changing those behaviors from the ground up would then start to initiate, if you like, the cultural shift that they were looking for in the organization. Yeah. So what, what you're describing sounds a lot, um, I, I don't know if you've come across this idea of the ambidextrous organization, you know, where you are both exploiting and exploring at the same time. And, and uh, or many organizations will be caught in the middle, right? Yeah. As you described, you know, they are either exploiting a lot of their knowledge, their capabilities, they want to be productive, you know, they want to keep performance at the levels that they have always kept. Um, and, and meeting customer demands, and they would be risk averse in trying something new, in learning new capabilities, in being innovative, etc. Um, and on the other hand, you may also find organizations that are trying to do too many things at one time, right? Yeah. And they're constantly shifting through multiple new business models or new initiatives or uh, you know, trying to be innovative, but in the process of doing so, they forget about the basics. Um, so, you know, being both um, uh, good at exploring new ideas and at the same time exploiting your existing capabilities to serve current markets and current customer segments becomes quite a challenge. And there are trade-offs between the two extremes. Right? There are. Um, there are, and it's a hard one. It's a hard one to deal with. There's lots of ways of dealing with it, and in many organisations, you might want to think about having almost like two different operating models to address those different areas: the 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 innovation and then the exploitation um, parts of the business. But I think if you're talking about if you're talking about an organisation who wants to move from being um, who wants to move from where they are now to being somewhere somewhere different, there's going to be some innovation involved along the way there. Um, and I think in, in many ways, this is where you ha you're probably going to start to think about taking a different approach to transformation because it's actually very hard to transform an organization. To actually take a large organization that's in flight and change it is incredibly difficult. And what organizations might want to think about doing is actually building something new within the organization mm -hmm. and then gradually migrating to that new organization and letting the old one drift away. And the reason I think that's really important, again, if we keep it on the, on the cultural dimension, is use the analogy that when somebody joins a new organization, they bring, if you like, their personal baggage with them to that organization, but they leave their old organizational baggage behind because they're joining a new organization. So let somebody, say somebody moved from IBM to Microsoft, they lose their IBM baggage and they, they they, but they take their personal baggage and go to Microsoft. The same the other way around, going from Microsoft to IBM. Um, if you actually change roles in an organization, you keep your organizational baggage with you. And so one of the things we talk about is, is, is traveling lightly, is trying to create a new organization which is going to work in new ways. It's going to have a new culture. It's going to have new ways of working, new dynamics within there. 
letting people join that new organization such that they leave their organizational baggage with them and then gradually grow out that organization so all of those old artifacts get behind. Um, so I think transformation, whilst it will look like transformation on the outside, on the inside it's actually building new and letting something old die away. It also allows you to carry on using the old business to fund your new business while you are building your new business out. So again, culture becomes a really, really important fact in, in how you decide to change your organization. But large scale total transformation is, is very, very difficult. So you probably want to do it in pockets anyway. And I, and I hear you saying that there are two ways to change culture, right? There's the, the soft learning, behavioral incentives, you know, encouraging innovative activities, etc. But there's also, I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, that structural separation, right, or spatial separation between units, you know, having one unit work on an innovative new idea while keeping, you, you mentioned keeping, keeping the old while working on the new yeah. and then transitioning, right? So this, this structural, um, you know, mechanism of uh, separating units, working on different um, ideas at the same time, and then gradually transitioning, right, um, one to the other. Um, but at the same time, you need to keep giving incentives for learning and changing behaviors, et cetera, which are more softer, I would say, ways of changing cultural, uh, uh, changing the culture within an organization. Yeah, and I think you have to use the same techniques in, in both circumstances. It's, it's just, it, it depends on the scale of what you're trying to do. If you're trying to, if you're trying to transform an entire organization, I do believe that a structural separation is probably going to be the best way of doing that and letting something, um, something small emerge and grow and let something um, that you, is not desirable anymore, else you wouldn't want to move to the new model, um, die. But equally, all of the techniques you talked about, the softer techniques, the rewarding, the behaviors, the, um, the allowing, allowing the successful behaviors to be very, very visible, regardless of success or not, is important mm -hmm. in, in either model. And I think that's, that's where we sort of have to recognize that the, as we were talking about when we spoke recently, if you actually go out there and search on the internet for actually how you change culture, there's nothing out there. Um, organizations will say that you know culture is important you need to do this you need to do that there's lots of analysts talking about it um, and there are indeed some people saying that you can do small interventions and I, you know I won't comment on on some of those but the only way that culture changes is through experiences is a culture whether it's a national culture um, whether it's an organizational culture it, it changes through experiences and the, the most powerful experiences, because it, talking about social groupings, are shared experiences. So shared mm -hmm. experiences will shape the culture more than anything else. And there's also, you know, the old maxim that no revolution ever started from the top anyway. Um, <laughs> so in an organization, you have a dominant culture, and the dominant culture is the way people behave, their language, their informal network. There's probably within that some residual culture as well, which are some cultural behaviors and language which, which comes from a time that's gone by and nobody can really remember why they exist. And then the other type of culture which is important is emergent culture. And we all know that every dominant culture used to be an emergent culture, but not every emergent culture becomes the dominant culture. So what you're looking to do as an organization is you're trying to understand what you would like the dominant culture to be. You're then trying to generate, and I say generate rather than create, it's hard to create, or cr set the environment su that, such that some new behaviors and language and informal networks can emerge, and then support those through experiences so that mm -hmm. they start to become the norm. When you get to that 20, 25% tipping point, that everybody is behaving using different languages, their networks are emerging in different ways, then you start to get the, the snowball effect that the, the emerging culture that you've been trying to foster and nurture can start to become the dominant culture because people will look over and see, ah, I can see that they were doing this and every time they did this, 
it was shouted about, it was good news, everybody liked it. I'm going to be a bit more of that. I'm going to be a bit more Panos. Panos is getting rewarded for the behaviors he's doing within the organization. I'm going to be a bit more like Panos. And I think you know, that's, that's the model that you need to put in place. So again, it goes back to my, the comment I made at the top about preconditioning before you deliver the change. So you want to start to help generate that new emergent culture. What are the behaviors you want? What language do you want people to use? Who do you want them to connect to? And through rewarding their experiences and their shared experiences and supporting and publishing their shared experiences, this project wasn't successful. What a great job the team did. Here's what we learned from it. Then you can start to generate that culture. But the only way you can change culture is by the way that culture changes anyway, which is it emerges by the environment around it driving that culture. I want to switch gears a little bit and, and, and talk about the role of technology in shaping cultural um, transformation. And, and obviously, in the same way that you introduce different activities, like in Google, you have the 20% rule where people work on their own projects, right? Or in recent years, and especially after COVID, a lot of businesses have implemented this um, rule that um, you work from home two, three days a, a week. Um, again, that's inducing behavioral change through, I guess, introducing structural means, right? And and I would I would assume that introduction of the introduction of technology, certain types of technology also um, have this effect. But is it the same? And and I want you to comment on that. Is is technology can technology play the same role as um, other forms of cultural change that we have discussed um, in, in allowing this emergence to take place? Um, I think realistically that technology can be a tool that you can use to support it. Um, the introduction of a technology will introduce, um, will, is likely to have an influence on behaviors, have an influence on language. I mean, language is a great example where people start to use terminology which is inherent within the technology that they're using, you know. Um, and great examples would be the, the the spread of Microsoft Office across the world. Everybody now uses language on a daily basis, which is actually comes out of their use of Microsoft Office for the past twenty years or something like that. So, I do think it has an impact, and it will change the way that people behave because there's a direct connection between um, the technology, the work. And then the behaviors that and language that fills in the gaps between between work. So it fills in the gaps around process. It fills in the gaps around policy. And we always all know that culture, behaviors, and language always come to the fore in a vacuum, if you like. If there isn't a policy controlling something, if there isn't a process controlling something, then people will revert back to culture in a, in terms of making their decisions about how they behave. Um, so it all comes back to the mindset. So technology will have a role in that because technology is an artifact that supports structure. Technology um, supports process as well. So it will have an influence on that. So the process change you get, the structural change you get, the ways of working change you get will come up against culture and there will be some movement there between the behaviors and language you use in the organization. So the important thing is to recognize what that's likely to be when you're thinking about introducing a technology. Um, not just a technology for from cultural basis, but any introducing any technology. What is it likely to do to the way that people behave? How will they start to work together? How will they collaborate together? How will they communicate with each other? What are the implications there? Um, it will have an effect. The stronger the culture, the lesser the effect is going to be. And in many ways, I think that's why you see some terrible system failures some terrible implementation failures is because the str the culture is so strong if you're trying to introduce new ways of working using technology which is fundamentally what you're often trying to do the culture can resist it the culture can say no we're not going to behave in that way we're not going to work in that way we're not going to communicate in that way and it can happen so you do have to recognize that that phenomenon will exist and make sure that you're you're addressing that right from the outset. Again, precondition, 
rather than say, right, now I've implemented the technology, how am I going to fix the culture? Fix the culture first, then implement the technology. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I can share, and I, I'm sure you have similar experiences, I can share the experience that we had um, at the in the university after COVID, you know, when we had to implement all sorts of productivity tools and that replaced essentially the way we used to do things. One of the mostly, uh, you know, uh, used tools was was Microsoft Teams, exactly because we could have virtual meetings, but at the same time share documents, uh, send messages to people, etc. And obviously, there's a, a lot of good things um, took place um, because of that, but there were also a number of unintended consequences, like you know, people using Teams to send messages about pretty much everything to the point that they they had to be told off you know just stop sending mass emails to people you know about pretty much everything we had to implement a number of mechanisms to monitor use and regulate and govern how those tools were used at least in the workplace what people did outside the workplace was their business but in the workplace we had to regulate those right so I guess it, it, it speaks to your point about emergence and mm. managing that emo- emergence, assessing the effects that the technology has on the changing of the culture and then reintervening again to, to make corrections, right? Absolutely. And I think there's another good example as well, and you see it, um, you, you can often see it in, in public sector organizations. And it's the con- you were talking about sharing files, etc. And the concept of sharing within an organization is very much deeply rooted in the culture of an organization. A couple of, couple of examples that I, I tend to come across all the time. The first one would be a shared services, organizations moving to a shared services. And what's really interesting is everybody kind of likes the idea of shared service. Having a shared service is more cost effective for me. I don't have to worry about it. I can just consume, etc. And I'm happy to do a shared service, but I want everybody to share my service. I don't want to share everybody else's service. And there is that. So trust is an important aspect of, of culture as well. And one of the things that is always important to do is to assess those trust dynamics when you're talking about implementing shared service. The other one that's particularly interesting, and you'll see this in financial services organization, is just the sharing of data. You see, um, again, public sector financial services, both very, very strong in this, is everybody really buys into the concept of shared data, of a single version of everything being shared about the organization, everybody using it, everybody contributing to it. But the trouble is, I don't trust everybody else's data. So I like the idea of sharing data. Everybody can use mine as long as I trust them. But I certainly don't trust anybody else's data. So again, these are are great examples of where you might introduce technology-based change in the organization, but the culture will just be a very, very strong barrier to that technology-based change. And... It's something which is an organizational culture thing often rather than an individual culture thing. You, you find in most organizations, if you find that somebody doesn't trust everybody else's data, nobody trusts everybody else's data. It's part of the culture. It's really an individual thing. Same with shared service. If they don't trust anybody else's shared service, nobody trusts it. Yeah, so interesting point. So trust, I guess, trust in the data, trust in the way people do things, right? Um, and the way those activities change with new technologies. Um, interesting that you mentioned um, financial services um, in a previous discussion I had with someone else uh, on the podcast. Um, in financial services, it, it has been, it, it's a notorious case where uh, banks share data between themselves through WhatsApp. And I, I think it's, it's, it's public information now, even though it's it's a very insecure way to to share data. Um, but as you say, it's it's just the way people were used to doing things, sending things over email, and now they send it over WhatsApp without realizing that email was regulated through internal security services, mm. whereas with WhatsApp, 
you're in a public network now um, uh, managed by an external party. You don't have uh, agreements in the same way that you have agreements with, with your security partners, you know, IS security partners. Um, so it's interesting that the activity continues without realizing that the, the technological parameters of the activity have, have changed and therefore you need to regulate them differently. So interesting points around trust <laughs> uh, in, on the data, security issues and all the rest of it um, that absolutely connect with the way the organization does things, right? The culture of the organization. Yeah. And I think the trust issue actually comes back to not so much trust of the, the trust of the data or trust of the system. It comes to trust of the other people who are the owners of the system or who have initiated the system. And I think the WhatsApp example is is, is just a fantastic one, is that um, there's, there's an irony in saying that I don't want to share data on this corporate system because I don't trust the people using it and I don't trust the corporate system where if I choose to use something like WhatsApp, I'm making the choice and therefore I trust my own choice to use WhatsApp. So again, it's, it's very, very interesting to see that those cultural dynamics playing out in this space. Yeah. And, and that brings us to the next topic of our discussion, which is transitioning this cultural change with the external partners. So you mentioned, you know, you have all sorts of technologies um, and obviously all sorts of different partners that work with you to achieve your value proposition in the market, mm. whatever that is, and meet customer demands, etc. My question is, you know, how is the workplace culture being externally transformed by these technologies and the suppliers, the partners that organizations um, have? Again, I think it's very interesting is that the um, the dynamics in terms of partnerships and organizations working together have changed significantly um, over the years. What we what we used to see, going back to certainly when I was when I started working, is that these dynamics in terms of um, in terms of ecosystems were very fixed. Um, every there was you know a nice linear supply chain that we used to describe in business schools from primary products right through to to the end consumer and as as the world has changed as economy has changed economies have changed and as as certainly as technology has has disrupted many industries or certainly changed the dynamics in those industries we're seeing a more fluid model within um within organizations and that's that's affecting the way that organizations are starting to think about their work i mean supply chain issues recently that organizations have, have faced is that organizations are getting to the point where their supply chains cannot be hardwired anymore because by having them hardwired, if that is disrupted, what's your plan B? What's your alternative? How are you gonna how are you gonna build resilience into your supply chain? You're not gonna do it by locking it down and hardwiring anything. You're actually gonna you're gonna build resilience in by opening up and making it dynamic and adaptive, that's the term we use for it. Um, which brings us on to the there's going to be, and it connects to a cultural dynamic across um, across ecosystems. And we talk about this concept of ecosystem versus ego system. Um, and an ego system is defined where you believe you are the center of the universe. And we all know that the reality is you need to define customer, citizen, or consumer at the center of an ecosystem. Um, and then recognize that there's a difference between um, value creation and value capture. Um, it used to be the view that because it was an ego system, I had to be right close to value creation, and that's where I do the value capture. That's the best place for me. But in in most most organisations, actually haven't occupied that position in the in the customer ecosystem. They've occupied occupied a different position in the ecosystem. So the idea behind an organisation is is to really think about where you're going to play in an ecosystem. And where is best place for you to capture value um, in that ecosystem? And it may not be at the point that value is created. If you think of the, the full ecosystem, we were working with, um, with an organization recently where we could have gone right to the front end with this, with this public customer and we could have engaged with them to deliver the full service. We recognize that our strength 
and the best place for us to to capture value was was in the provision of technology and infrastructure services and not many of the other services that came as part of this um, this packet of work. So we partnered with another organization who would normally have been seen as a competitor to us, um, but they had strengths in an area that we didn't have. We had strengths in an area they didn't have. So they are now at the point of value capture, the front end with the with the end the end consumers of the service. And we are stepped back from that in that model, we're all we're both able to optimize the value that we're getting from that relationship and the value that ultimately from the provision of that service into the recipients of that service. So and again that required a different way of thinking, a different mindset and connecting into the culture as well, to think about ourselves differently, think about our role in that very differently, and also to look at the trust relationship between the parties to understand you know how we could make sure that we were working as one how we had the trust built into that relationship into our ways of working so that we could we could establish a set of behaviors more than the processes and the contracts in place at first a set of behaviors that would allow us to you know to coexist very very successfully in the provision of that service yeah so it's interesting so um essentially through these cloud-based um, uh, technologies that are emerging, a lot of organizations are realizing that, as you say, they cannot play the role that they used to play anymore. They're part of bigger ecosystems. They have to shift the way they value create and value capture. Some companies will not be in a position to play the role that Microsoft is playing or Amazon is playing because obviously they don't have the capabilities to do that. And, and that creates tensions, obviously, right? I mean, um, especially if you are a large organization that used to be a systems integrator or big supplier for a number of different clients, and now you realize that things are done differently. It, it, it's a big shock, but obviously this is digital disruption and it's happening and it's changing relationships. And through that, you need to go back and rethink the way um, you manage things internally. I, I guess that's that's what you're saying. Um, sure. And 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 there is there is a different structure to managing these relationships that affects this process of value creation and value capture. Yeah, it is. It, it comes back to um, you know your core identity as an organization is is it for for many organizations certainly in the systems integrator world for example it was fixed for a very very long time we own the customer everybody else sits behind us and we we provide services into that um and in a in a stable world that was absolutely fine because that's what the customers needed they need somebody to be the funnel of these things in now the disruption has taken place now you've got technology moving so quickly you've got the the hyperscale vendors who are um bringing new things to market at scale um, almost as commodities very, very quickly, you do have to reconsider your your position uh, within that market. Perhaps one of the most important things that we're seeing now is because of that pace of change, it's very, very hard to move from one position to another fixed position, if you like, because that fixed position could be very, very transient with the pace of technology change that's, that's taking place at the moment. So what we're starting to see and what we're starting to look at is organizations being more adaptive. And it's not just in the technology world, you're seeing it in the automotive world as well, you're seeing it in financial services world as well, is that people are adopting different positions. Increasingly, they're gonna have to be more adaptive as organizations so that they continually adopt new positions as disruption occurs and you take financial services for example all of the disruption coming from fintech small fintech organizations the disruption that's coming in particularly from fintech using ai within financial services they're having to reevaluate their position vis-a-vis -vis the, com the consumer and vis-a-vis -vis different organizations in that ecosystem but because that change is constant and coming from different directions they're going to have to be more and more adaptive so that they can pivot really, really quickly. And not pivot everything, but pivot the things they need to pivot. And perhaps we're seeing, we might see a growth towards more modular businesses as we move forward. 
with different bits of the organization prepared to pivot. Almost, and again, this has been talked about for some time, an organization as organic as opposed to mechanistic. So an organization can move resources to one area very, very quickly. It can let other parts of the organism die, um, or it can change the shape of different bits of the organization to move them quickly. But here we're starting to talk about when we are talking about changes in an organization in, you know, sort of 10 years ago and previous to that, we were talking about changes taking place over three years, 18 months to three years. We would talk about these large scale transformation projects usually preceded by a massive document uh, written by some great consultants, et cetera. And then that would take 18 months to percolate through. 18 months is now 18 weeks, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so you're, you're starting to need, see the need to move more quickly to be able to capture value at a point in the ecosystem for a period of time and then potentially move again or potentially withdraw, potentially enter a new new ecosystem completely. And that's going to take some rethinking of the way that organizations are built. It's going to take some rethinking of the organizational structures. It's going to take some rethinking of the processes in the organization. Technology can have a massive role to play here, but only if technology is implemented in the style in which the, arc the market is moving, which is which is very fast, which is very adopt it rather than adapt it, um, use it the way it's intended. And if the technology doesn't work for you, throw it out, keep the data, and bring another one in. And I think we're going to see those changes. Mm -hmm. This all comes against a cultural backdrop drop where you're going to have to start to precondition your culture to be an adaptive culture, to be one that is comfortable with ambiguity, that is comfortable with change, that is comfortable with experimentation, that is comfortable for adopting new ideas. And I can see this as being the biggest shift that organizations are going to have to take over the next few years. Now we're in the post-pandemic post period where there was that massive disruption. Is how do you build an adaptive culture such that you can foster an adaptive organization? Yeah, and that's that's a great uh, way of uh, linking our earlier discussion with uh, with this one. Um, and and I want to just uh, spend maybe one or two minutes. I know I'm conscious of the time. Uh, one or two minutes more on this idea of ego system versus ecosystem. And there are cases, there are sectors where organizations used to be partners, but now they are fighting for the same uh, piece of the pie exactly because of these disruptions and this transformation that is taking place in the market. So in those cases, they will have to work together. They will have to adapt and egos will have to be put aside. But how easy is it and what needs to take place? What kind of governance mechanisms, um, what kind of changes in the way that we talked about cultural changes earlier, what kind of changes do they have to make now in relation to their ecosystem strategy? Um, whew, that's quite a, <laughs> that's quite a subject to put through. That's a like. tough one. <laughs> um, <laughs> governance is governance again is is something that's going to have to change. Governance in the past was some very you know some very hardwired contracts that were in place. I think we're starting to talk about the concept of interfaces between organisations rather than handoffs between organisations and controls around those interfaces rather than rather than governance in the, in a more traditional formal way a contractual governance per se so that you're going to have to define the interface between an organization and adopt some some ideas around ways of working some behaviors i think it's going to be increasingly important to talk about the behaviors you want to see as well as much as the hardwired things within that within that construct because um, because they're going to have to move so quickly, because they're going to have to do so dynamic. You don't have the luxury of writing a whole new set of contracts and everything else every time you need to do this. It's, it's something that's it's going to make you less adaptive than you need to be in that construct. So I, I think defining the interface as well, being very open and honest about the value exchange between the organizations, and then and, and then being very, very clear together on what the behaviors are going to need to be from everybody involved in that work 
is going to be more important than some of the traditional methods. There's still going to have to be contractual mechanisms in place. You, you're never going to get away from that. There's still going to have to be some governance in place. But if you are, if you are being adaptive, one of the big questions we talk about, and probably a completely different subject, is where the decision making is going to take place. Because traditionally, organizations were designed so that you would filter information up through the organization. It would get to some a decision-making level, and the decision would be made, and then the decision would filter down to the organization. That takes time. We've seen an example of the OODA loop, where you're going to be success you're more successful the faster you move through the, the OODA loop. So what we see is that there's going to be an approach to this, which is connects to the whole organizational approach around decision-making, and to use, again, to go back to David Marquette, um, author of Turn the Ship Around, is about moving authority to information as opposed to moving information to authority. So those involved at the interface between the organizations in the ecosystem will have decision-making capability. The reason why is the trust relationship exists within the organization. Again, goes back to the culture. And they they are best placed to make that decision because they are closest to the information. So I think governance is going to sit at the interface as opposed to at the center of organizations as you move to an adaptive model through where you've got ecosystems versus ecosystems. Yeah. And that's, I guess, it goes back to your point about modular organizations, right? Because those interfaces would work better with modular organizations as opposed to uh, you know, organizations that are quite um, cumbersome, you know, with lots of hierarchies and interdependent systems, etc. Being modular would allow you to um, implement those kinds of interfaces at the point of interaction with the other party, right? And obviously, there's going to be incentives built in the interfaces, you know, what one party brings versus what the other party brings, how the two are combined for um, you know, a different uh, improved value proposition to the customer or the client organization, whoever that is, um, the other end uh, that receives the services um, from the ecosystem. So very interesting and exciting developments. Um, so final, final um, question before we, uh, we end. Um, so your chief digital advisor, What's your vision of the future? I think that the the pace of change is going to continue relentlessly. There's going to be, you know, we're seeing lots and lots of social fractures taking place around the globe at the moment. So that's going to have its knock-on effect into everything as business, coupling with the pace of change of, of technology, which is, it, it's going to just drive change on top of change on top of change and everything needing to be adaptive, everything not being hardwired is, is probably the way we're going um, we're gonna to do things. I think we're, we're at the cusp when it comes to, if you like, the, again, the human technology interface is with, if you look at how much is being invested in artificial intelligence and similar areas at the moment, as we're doing ourselves, um, there's a question now in terms of which way it's going. And there's lots of concern around AI taking over the world, taking over people's jobs, et cetera, et cetera. Where we're trying to go with it and what my vision for the future is, um, along with colleagues within the business, is that we can harness the power of technology, particularly with things like AI, to augment the human experience, to augment those things which are uniquely human that make us who we are, both in our, in our work, in our lives, and in our play. And if we can use technology for good, technology to support trust, um, technology to underpin good cultural dynamics, good employee experience, good human experience, good customer experience, then we're going to be successful with, we can call what we've done in our advancement, moving towards technology being at the pinnacle of advancement, if you like, through, um, we, we can call it successful. We can say that Everything that we are building is making lives and work for everybody better by enhancing. Mm -hmm. So if, you know, if I had one wish to come true in terms of the technology world now, that technology could make the lives of every single individual on the planet better, 
it would be made more accessible to every single individual on the planet to improve their lives, improve the work we do, improve our relationships with each other, um, and use it to help bring back that human connection as opposed to driving apart that human connection, which we, we, we've seen examples of it doing in the past. So, yeah, if we can augment human comp- connection using technology, then we're going to be in a good place. That's a great uh, wish for the future, uh, Marcus, and I definitely share that. Um, it has been a pleasure. Thank you so much um, for coming on the podcast. I, I really learned a lot, and uh, I'm sure uh, our viewers will also appreciate your thoughts on this. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Really nice to talk to you. Thanks, Thanos.